This question is for Jessica. How are you determining your oiling degrees? Visually? Just visually. Yeah. It was uh, it with birds in the hand, too. Sea side sparrows and the cryptic coloring. Um, I'm not the sea side sparrow, sorry, the, the cryptic coloring of the shorebirds. How how successful do you feel like you were? I think I was really successful. Again, the birds were actually in my hand, and especially they're generally in winter plumage as well. So their their plumage is a lot lighter in the winter time. So the majority of the species I was looking at, um, we we could definitely see that. And we did pretty extensive, you know, I have them in the hand and look at look at them really closely. I wasn't looking them under UV light or anything though. So there's also the chance that, that some of that oil was missed. Other questions? This is your, your time. Andy. Kind of a follow up to that one. If you had visually estimated their oiling before you got them in your hand, how accurate do you think the, how correlated do you think those two estimates would be? Not at all. Oh, really? <laughs> it's because, uh, especially with shorebirds, uh, you know, I feel like it's almost impossible to really estimate the amount of oil you're seeing unless they're completely covered in oil. Even the juvenile uh, Wilson's clovers, which had um, a d decent amount of oiling on them, it really wasn't until I had them in the hand that you would see it. And for the shorebirds that I experienced, they were getting the oiling right um, around their chest and you know in, in that area because they're for Wilson's clovers, for example, they're well, or even foraging and roosting in the rack that kind of comes along. That's the oil rack, and then they're, that's they're getting it in this kind of area there, and that's not something you could really see. I mean, the good scope. Close, close up, but not really. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for actually for Kendall. You might have touched on this, uh, but do you expect that there there could be uh, species specific behaviors that could contribute to maybe differences that you could see if you looked at other species as well? Yeah, we looked at four to five species, depending on how you looked at it. We uh, we had western sandpipers in there. Um, some of those shoreland species, which I didn't um, mention, they were in metabolic um, and thermoregulatory studies at that University um, of, uh, University of Western Ontario, um, as well as laughing gulls, um, the pigeons, the cormorants. Um, we tapped in some other flight studies that weren't technically part of the project as well. So the laughing gulls stopped eating. They wouldn't eat or drink anything. The cormorants did not stop eating or drinking until the very last day before they decided to die or were euthanized. Um, and so that created a problem because we couldn't get the oil orally into the laughing gulls um, for us from that experiment perspective. But it also um, caused dehydration in these animals. Um, and laughing gulls are kind of known to be the garbage and not feeder, which is why they were there because they're expected to have, we were trying to represent a species expected difference of being upregulated and being able to handle toxins and that kind of thing. Um, we couldn't totally um, cause mortality the way we did, unfortunately. We didn't actually expect cause mortality at that level, but we did um, in the cormorants um, because they, they stopped eating. Um, that doesn't mean they were going to survive in the wild. It, it just doesn't mean it meant that we could continue the project. Western sandpipers are interesting. They picked everything. They plucked all their feathers out. Mm -hmm. So instead of preening it out and trying to, um, you know, have uh, or create a sheen, um, which is what a lot of the, the cormorants seem to be doing, which they were not very successful at, um, they actually just were naked, which we didn't know was actually going to happen, but. <laughs> fortuitously they were in the thermal regulatory project. Um, so they had their feathers there. So there's definitely behavioral differences and, and, and things that will change that. And of course, migratory birds, um, the reason we had that bird in there is they're flying thousands of miles, it's itty bitty 30 gram bird. Um, so it's a whole different stress level for them than maybe laughing little that's going to sit around in the garbage can. Kind of thing. Um, I have a couple of online questions. For Kendall, what biomarkers or measurements could responders collect in the field during the next spill that would be the most useful for <laughs> estimating injury? Okay, well, this is the question. Yeah. <laughs> um, what I think is that um, 
we need to set up a sampling protocol with a matrix to cross the species differences so that we are going to pick up as much damage that's actually being done as possible. I can't pick one biomarker and say this is going to work across species, at least at this point. I mean, maybe that'll happen at some point, but I definitely don't have the data to do that. Um, I do think troponin, that cardiac marker, is going to be critical. Um, we saw differences, um, significant differences in urea, which is a protein metabolite. Um, in most species, it's a measure of kidney damage. Um, and, you know, that anemia is critical um, as that anemia progresses. That's really a sign that the birds are going to not do well. Um, and things that are observational, you know, like the, I think that's easy or maybe to document just with a photograph, is, you know, blood and feces and things like that should not be overlooked because that's a really bad sign. Um, you know, that the bird's probably not going to survive. Um, so, I'm not sure that was, that, that's a start, let me say, to answer that question. Okay. And then one for Jessica. Um, did the bird oil rates determine the proper and levels of the rehabilitation approaches? I think the ant probably shouldn't be there. Deter did the bird oil rates determine the proper levels of rehabilitation approaches? So for my study, actually, the birds that I were capturing were did not require rehabilitation. Uh, they, all the birds that I captured had only light or trace amounts of oiling on them, um, and so they did, did not require that. Um, I know there's probably lots and lots of other folks in this room who actually could probably answer that question a lot better than, than I regarding oiling levels and rehabilitation, though. So maybe that's a have to be answered later for some of the other folks. And I have a question for you, just your um, Waveland and Ocean Springs sites, the moderately oiled sites, just because I live in Ocean Springs, was that on the mainland or at the islands? It was on the mainland, um, on the back side of the group, right from Bayou area there, right, right where the, the coastal beach is there. So would that be Front Beach or East Beach? Uh, front, front Beach. Front Beach, okay. Yeah. I just don't remember there being much in the way of cleanup there, so I was... There actually was not. It was actually a... Um, so the Greenland by the site is actually a private beach. Okay. So there, there was... Um, in with the majority there, no, no cleanup ha happening there. Okay. So it was one of my moderately oiled sites, but lower disturbance. Right, sites. right, yeah. right. Okay. Uh, I have a non-oil question for Dr. Taylor related to the displacement of the seaside sparrows by Isaac, um, any indication whether they were using novel habitats or did they disperse to salt marsh in western Louisiana? Or? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. There was a little smidge of land along the Mississippi River that was still above water. Otherwise, they would have had to move west. Um, Ebert sightings, so Phil Stouffer did this analysis, Soon after the hurricane went through, Ebert sightings started showing seaside sparrows back in the Veritaire Bay area. So wherever they went, <laughs> they, they came back fairly quickly. My guess is they probably had to move west so that they stayed in the salt marsh, because moving out of the salt marsh I don't think would be tenable for them. It would have been great to have had some uh, Actually, we did have some uh, some geolocators on, on the birds. I think we had 10, like a very small sample initially, but we didn't retrieve any of them. And um, that, that wasn't so much for the, the hurricane, but it was for um, seeing whether there might be some, some western migration during the non-breaking season too, because there's some sort of anecdotal evidence that the abundance of seaside sparrows in the winter is lower than it is in the summer, and so maybe they are shifting a little bit along the coast. It would be really interesting to put some sort of a tag on the birds prior to a hurricane to see what it is they're doing <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Can I actually ask a question? Sure. So, and, and this is to people in the room as well, because I suspect the knowledge base is in the room. Um, and, and as well as well. um, so do we have um, population um, estimates or actual population detail 
I know we didn't have a lot from before 2012, but since 2012, on recovery of different species of birds. And is there any kind of trends that can be stated? Like, are they definitely recovering? Are they not recovering? Do you have increased mortality of chicks across the board? Um, how is recruitment going? Well, for the seaside sparrows, it looks like it's increasing, but you also have that drop in 2017. So I think you have this real problem that abundances change for different reasons, and unless you have long-term pre- and post-oil spill, it's going to be really difficult to tease out what's going on there exactly. And I think it also depends on the overall population size of the birds. So if you consider that that the edges of the marshes were oiled where the sparrows were, they have all that habitat farther north where there presumably wasn't a lot of oil. So if they killed a bunch of birds along the coast, you're going to get recolonization probably happening pretty quickly from birds elsewhere. Yeah, I think that's a really hard question. Yeah. So is there any data on the success sparrow before 2012? <laughs> not in that area. Yeah. Yeah, so I did just come from the National Marine uh, Mammal Foundation, and they were obviously focused more on mammals, but um, they maintain that dolphin populations are declining, and they have um, something like a decrease of 80 to 90 percent of recruitment. So obviously different than birds, as we stated, they can fly and, and get away, which I don't think that. The they're asking to speak up can. online, so if y'all can. Oh, yeah. I mean, you don't need to show, but they're just okay. saying it's challenging to hear. So that's Sorry. The, um, yeah, I'm not, I don't usually have a problem being quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I, I was saying that the um, marine mammal guys that are doing monitoring through NOAA are um, seeing either a steady state or decline in population. Um, from a 2012-2013 where they had a mass mortality, they have had disease outbreaks that are worse than normal, so multivariable issues, but is it worse because the animals are now immunocompromised from a toxin and we have a multivariate effect? Um, and then the decrease in 90, that's something, it depends on who you're talking to, but a significant, let's say, decrease in recruitment um, of something like 60 to 90 percent decrease in recruitment. So I, I just, while birds are different, I gotta believe that there's something similar to that as well going on. Um, we just may not have the data to be able to um, bring it out. Does anybody have any data that they could? Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, there's, there's there have been um, water bird surveys in Louisiana, nesting water bird surveys since. Well, late or late seventies, and since the seventies now, as far as standardization of uh, how these data were collected, that's something that needs to be discussed. Um, that being said, wildlife and fisheries um, and Wasco, I believe, um, have partnered to create a more standardized methodology of, of, of doing water bird surveys. Um, so, hopefully, over the course of the next few years, um, we may have better numbers. Um, but as far as baseline, um, we have numbers, but it's not standardized. Um, so it's kind of a dot-to-dot -dot survey, um, flying to and from each colony um, to get numbers. But you know, we may miss colonies in between. Um, so we can we can kind of get population indices, but um, it's not super rigorous you know, statistically. I would say. Um, we also can you make any preliminaries? <laughs> I'm giving feedback, I'm not sure if anybody else is. Um, can you make any preliminary statements on um, any specific species, population changes, or anything? You know, I would be hesitant to say much in the way of anything concrete because there's so much noise um, okay. from year to year surveys, uh, at least presently. Uh, you know, Pelicans are on an uptick for sure over the, over the longer term. Uh, black skimmers are on the certainly on a decrease over the longer term, I guess I would say. Um, but yeah, as far as um, deep water horizon, I think it may take quite a bit more time to really pin that down. 
Another angle maybe we could take on that is you can estimate population size with genetic data. So if you took a more modern sample and estimated it and then got um, historic DNA and a new collections, you could take an estimate prior to the Oxford as well. Those numbers are quite rough, but if you see big consistent differences across species, that might. I'm sorry to cut off the discussion right now, but we need to move on. Uh, with our next guest speaker, but I love the, the conversations that are happening and I hope that you all continue them 